friend. I am so glad you joined us today. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn with me to the book of 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 14, and we're going to read verse 11 and verse 12. 2 Chronicles 14, verse 11 and 12. And Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. I, I want to talk to you for the next few minutes on the subject, the battle for your trust. The battle for your trust. How do we put our trust in God and, and then keep it there? The battle for your trust. Now in our text, Asa is the king of the two southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And his army numbers 580,000 men. One day, Zira, an Ethiopian, brought his army to fight with Asa, and his army numbered over one million men. Asa's outnumbered almost two to one, and he knows the odds are against him. He knows there is no way humanly possible that he's going to defeat this large army. So he cries out to God for God's help, and God helps him. He does. He he helps him defeat Zira and his large army and turn them back, turn them away. Well, a short time later, Baasha, the king of the ten northern tribes of Israel, came down to do battle with Asa, a much easier battle for Asa than the odds were much better. And yet, instead of turning to God and asking God for his help, Asa makes a treaty with Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria. Now, this didn't set well with God, so he sent the prophet Hanani to give Asa a message from him. And the message was this, because you trusted the king of Syria instead of the Lord your God, you will have wars for the rest of your days. And he did. He did. He really did. See, Asa started out so good. He, he put his trust in God. And then he ended up putting his trust in himself, his own resources and connections. Paul, the Apostle Paul, faced a similar problem with the churches in Galatia. Now, Galatia is not a city. It's a, a region in Asia Minor. And there are five, uh, there are several significant cities. Among them is Antioch, uh, Iconium, Lystra, and, and Derby. Now, Paul writes a letter to be circulated throughout all of the churches in Galatia. And the letter is intended to rebuke the Judaizers and to refute what they had been teaching. Now, the Judaizers, they were religious legalists religious legalists, and they believed that there were still Old Testament laws binding on Christians. So they taught them also that uh, the promises of God were only extended to the Jews. And if a Gentile wanted to uh, participate in the, the promises of God, they would have to be circumcised. Now, they didn't deny that faith in Jesus was important. They just taught that it wasn't enough. And so throughout Galatia, Christians are reverting back to practicing the law and adding a little bit of faith in Jesus with it. And Paul writes to them in his letter. We know it as the book of Galatians. He writes to them and he wants to know who tricked you. Who fooled you that you would start out so well? You started out in the spirit and, and you reverted back to the law. You ended up in the flesh. Who tricked you? You know, 
They did. They started out good, trusting God for their salvation by grace. And then they reverted to trusting their ability to keep the law, their flesh. So how do we, how do we keep our trust in the God of miracles? Well, we first have to deal with some problems. There are two potential problems that'll keep us from placing our trust in God and keeping it there. The first one is a false sense of arrival. A false sense of arrival. In other words, you develop a spiritually prideful heart. So prideful that you develop a, an unteachable spirit. Nobody can teach you anything because you know everything. And therefore you judge and measure and qualify everyone around you by your own standard of spirituality. A false sense of arrival. Unteachable spirit. The second problem that can keep us from trusting God and keeping our trust there is the temptation to trust our own flesh. A problem comes, and instead of turning to God, you turn to your own resources, your own abilities, your own connections. You end up trusting yourself and those who counsel you more than you trust God. As a matter of fact, truth be told, you only turn to God as a last resort, if you turn to him at all. So how do we keep our trust in the God of miracles? How do we do it? Well, here it is. The key to keeping your trust in God is your commitment to his word. The key to keeping your trust in God is your commitment to his word. Now, the key to trusting God is not found in what you do occasionally. It's found in what you do daily. As a matter of fact, your daily habits will largely determine whether or not you keep your trust in God at all times. Now, keeping your trust in God, it's going to require a daily Bible reading habit, a daily Bible reading habit. And here's why. Because the Bible is the number one place, number one medium through which God speaks to us. In Psalm 119 verse 124, it says, your word is my delight and my counselor. Now, counsel means that it's a two-way conversation. Your word is my delight and, and my counsel. And think of it this way. When we pray, we're talking to God. And when we read his Bible, he's talking to us. We pray, we talk to God, we read his word, he talks to us. And, and understand the level of your trust in God, it will never rise higher than your commitment to his word. So the number one priority of your day needs to be to take the time and read the Bible. Take time, number one priority of the day. James, uh, Proverbs chapter four and verse seven says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom in all of your getting, get understanding. So break it down, wisdom is the number one thing. So get it and then along with it, have understanding of it. So again, breaking it even further down, the Bible is the number one thing in our life. Therefore, read it and apply its truths to our life. Now, failure to develop a daily Bible reading habit, my friend, it's going to cost you dearly. If you do not develop this daily Bible reading habit, it's going to cost you dearly. Let me just give you some of the costs. Number one, you will uh, forfeit your peace of heart and your peace of mind when you find yourself in the midst of a trial. Psalm 119 verse 165 says, Great peace have they who love your law. Now, love means interaction, right? Great peace have they who love your word, interact 
with your words. So if you don't have a daily Bible reading habit, you're going to forfeit your peace of heart and your peace of mind in the midst of a trial. Uh, another thing is if you do not have a daily Bible reading habit, you'll become an easy target for the devil, an easy target for him. First Peter chapter five and verse eight says, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If you don't have a daily Bible reading habit, my friend, you're going to be an easy target for him. And just so you'll know, he's out looking for you. So get that daily Bible reading habit. Also, without a daily Bible reading habit, you will face your enemy, this adversary, without a weapon that he fears. You'll face your adversary without a, a weapon that he fears. In uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, you know the verse, it says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Then go down to verse 17, and it says, therefore, take the helmet of salvation, guard your mind, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So the Bible is identified in this passage as a weapon. It's the sword of the Spirit. And if you don't have a daily Bible reading habit, my friend, you're going to face your adversary without a weapon that he fears. He won't fear you empty-handed, but he will if you have the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, that you're going to use against him. Let me give you one more. Without a daily Bible reading habit, your trials are going to eventually overwhelm you to the point that you'll be tempted to, to quit, to give up, just to quit. In Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 10, it says, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Listen to that again. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. So a daily Bible reading habit, my friend, is critically important for us to do in order to keep our trust in God because our commitment to God's word is the key to our ability to keep our trust in God. But, but I, need to, I need to have you understand this. Commitment to God's word will come with opposition. It always does. Satan always opposes you reading the Bible. As a matter of fact, he'll do everything in his power. He'll do everything he knows to do to keep you from ever developing that habit. And here's why. Because he knows as soon as you develop a daily Bible reading habit, his access to you is going to be limited. And his hold over various areas of your life is going to be broken. So he opposes your time in the Word. You're developing a daily Bible reading habit. And understand, Satan's got an agenda against you personally. It's personal. He's got an agenda against you personally. His agenda is to destroy you and to destroy your trust in God. That's his agenda. Jesus said in John 10 and verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So his agenda is not just to mess with you and frustrate you and upset you and hurt your feelings and make you feel uncomfortable. No, no, it's much more than that. His, his agenda is to destroy you and everything about you, including your trust in God. Now, Satan will lie to you about God's trustworthiness, just like he lied to, to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You remember in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4, it says, The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. You'll not surely die. For God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be just like God, knowing good and evil. 
In other words, guys, you can't trust God. He's holding out on you. He's not being upfront with you on all things. He's forbidding you to do something because he knows if you do it, you're going to be just like him. He'll lie to you about that. As a matter of fact, Jesus addresses this lying propensity of, of the devil in, in John chapter 8 and verse 44. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, you are of your father, the devil. He does not stand in truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources because he's a liar and the father of it. Boy, that's pretty, that's pretty blunt, isn't it? So he'll lie to you to get you to stop trusting God or, or not even begin to place your trust in God. And, and then he'll do this. He'll try to blind your mind to the truths of God's word just so you won't trust him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, the Bible says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. Satan has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. And, and in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 12, it says, Don't let evil thoughts or doubts make any of you turn away from the living God. Don't doubt God and turn away from it. That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to doubt the promises of God so you'll turn away from him and, and not trust him. And then Satan wants you to believe that God has abandoned you and he's forgotten all about you. Oh, but my friend, listen, that's just not true. In Hebrews 13 and verse 5, it says, God is speaking. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Never. Now, never means never. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The psalmist said in Psalm 139 and verse 7 through 10, he said, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, Lord, you're there. If I make my bed in the, the hell of my circumstance, Lord, you're, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there will your hand lead me and your right hand will hold me. No, my friend, God has not abandoned you. You can't get away from him. And he certainly hasn't forgotten you. Listen to what he says in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15 and 16. It says, he asked the question, can a mother forget the child who nurses at her breast? Can a woman not love the, the infant that comes from her own body. Even if a woman could forget, God said, I will never forget you. You are always in my thoughts. Wow, what a promise. He's not abandoned you. You can't get away from him. And he hasn't forgotten you, my friend. He has not forgotten you. There's a there's another question that comes up a lot. And that question is, how do we keep our trust in God when it appears that God is not answering our prayers? Honest question. How do we keep our trust in God when, when it appears, all outward appearances, God is not answering our prayers? See, because when we, when we feel like God's not answering our prayers, we want to know why. Why, God, are you not answering my prayers? Well, let me give you the truthful and honest answer to that question. Nobody knows why. Only God knows why. Now, now don't get upset with him. Don't, don't get upset. God never promised to explain to you why he does what he does. He simply asks you to trust him. And it's true, trusting God when everything is going wrong and you don't understand, it's hard. It's going to require you to anchor your faith and trust in God even when you don't understand. It's going to require you to dig down deep and grab a hold of everything that you know and you believe about God and don't let go. 
It's going to demand that you accept the fact God knows what you don't know, and he can see what you cannot see. Therefore, it'll require you to defer to his judgment and then put the full weight of your trust in him and keep it there. Keep it there. No, it's not easy to trust God when it appears that um, he's not answering our prayer. But you know enough scripture to know that, that, that isn't, even that question isn't true because God said, call to me in Jeremiah 33, 3, I will answer you. He will in his own time and in his own way. So how do we win this battle for our trust in God? And it's a battle. How do we win it? Well, we go back and realize the Bible is your most effective wit uh, weapon against the devil and against his agenda against you. Understand, my friend, you're whining and complaining and crying and pouting and pleading and begging and, and threatening. None of those things move him, not in the least. But he knows he's defeated. He knows he's defeated when you use the word of God against him. You remember after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, the Bible says he was driven by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. And Satan came three times with three significant temptations. And each time Jesus banished Satan by quoting scripture to him. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 10 and 11, Jesus said to him, Satan, away with you, for it is written. Your greatest and, and most effective weapon against the devil and his agenda against you is the word of God. Use it. Now, you know this, I'm not telling you something that you don't know, but the battle for your trust in God, it's real. It's real. Don't let Satan win. Don't let him win. Determine when he attacks you to take your stand and fight back with the word of God. In James chapter 4 and verse 7, it says, Therefore, submit to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Take your stand and fight back with the word of God. Quote scripture at him and realize that when he attacks you, he's after two things. He's two, after two things. He's trying to break your commitment to God's word because he knows if he can do that, you won't keep your trust in God. And he's trying to break your trust in God, period. So my friend, determine no matter what's happening in your life, Determine that you're going to keep your trust in the God of miracles. I think of Job in the Old Testament. He lost his family, his wealth, and his health. Rapid succession, back to back, back. And he didn't understand. And he certainly, you read, read the book of Job, you'll see he didn't like it at all. He didn't understand it. But listen to what he said. He said, though he slay me, I will trust him. In other words, I'm going to place my trust in God. I'm going to keep it in God no matter what's happening in my life. I, I think of, the, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew young men in the Old Testament. They were in captivity in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, commissioned that a statue be made in his image. And then he mandated that everyone throughout his entire empire bow down to his statue and worship him. Well, when news reached Nebuchadnezzar that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down and, and worship his statue, he called for them. And then he said, listen, guys, here's the deal. You either bow down and, and worship my statue or I'll have you thrown into a fiery furnace. Listen to how they responded. They said, O oh, king, our God can deliver us from your hand. But even if he doesn't, we won't bow. We're going to keep our trust in God. I think of the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. 
boy, he lived in a terrible time in Israel's history. It, it almost like it couldn't get any worse. It was really bad. And, and Habakkuk basically said, no matter what happens, I will trust in God. Let, let me read his words to you. It's a Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. It says, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, and though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I will joy in the God of my salvation. Wow, I'm going to trust God no matter what happens in my life. And that's what you and I need to do. Regardless of what's going on, regardless of what we're facing, regardless of what's happening, we need to place our trust in God and keep it there. Keep it there. Perhaps some of you today are saying, Pastor, you just don't understand. You just don't understand. Things are so bad in my life. I don't think I'm going to make it. I don't think I'm going to make it. Well, now listen, if you haven't heard anything I've said up to this moment, don't miss what I'm about to tell you. Yes, you can make it. You can make it because of the promises that God has made to you. Let me give you just three. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, God is faithful. In other words, God never fails. And it goes on to say, he will not let your trial be beyond what you can bear. You feel like you've reached the end of your ability to, to stand. You feel like you're not going to make it. But God sees something in you that you don't even see in yourself. Yes, you're going to make it. Because he's not going to let your trial go beyond what you can bear. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, it says, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. It's sufficient for you. And my strength is made perfect in your weakness. In other words, my grace is all you need to get through this. And my strength is made perfect, completed. It's lacking nothing, even though you're weak. I'll bring you through it. And then there's a little verse tucked away in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 33 and verse 25. And the verse says this, As your days, so shall your strength be. As your days, so shall your strength be. In other words, God said, when I measured this day, your day, I gave you all the strength you would need to get through it. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Put your trust in God and keep it there. Let me, let me pray for you. My Father, I, I come to you in Jesus' name and I bring my friends with me. And I thank you for being so good to us. I thank you for the power and the promise of your word. I thank you that even though all hell uh, positions itself against us, they can't defeat us because you are with us. And if we place our trust in you and keep it there, you'll bring us through your way and in your time. My father some of my friends are hurting really bad today. They're going through some stuff. It's tearing them up. And I pray, I pray, Father, that you'll go to them right now and meet them at the point of their need. Do in them and for them what they cannot do for themselves. Show them your presence and your power moving against that agenda that's been set against them. Father, stir their heart to place their trust in you and to keep it there. Lord, I thank you that you're faithful. I thank you that you've never lost a battle. You, you never failed. Um, you've never been confused. You've never been uh, in a place where you didn't know what to do next. Never. You are faithful. And you'll be faithful to us as we go through what we're going through at this very hour. So again, my Father, do in my friend and for my friends what they cannot do for themselves. Be as close to them as they can imagine. And I thank you for it. I thank you for meeting them at the point of their need. Oh, I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
and amen. God bless you, my friend. Thank you for listening to this week's message. To stay up to date, please like us on Facebook at Touching Africa Ministries or visit our website at touchingafricaministries.org. If you would like to give online, head to touchingafricaministries.org slash donate.